Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the daily chart of the Dow 30 overlaid or the DAX index. Now, what I've drawn here is a double trend channel. And the reason I've drawn this is because they seem to track very, very closely, especially for the last three years, except when there's an extreme downdraft like we had here. So are we going to get another one of these? Well, they seem to be rallying things right now, but you can see that the DAX is down below this double trend channel, whereas the Dow bounced right off of it. So it remains to be seen if this is going to be the big one or they're going to pull another one out of the hat and rally this thing further. Doesn't really look like it to me. It looks like we're completing one of these tops. So we'll have to wait and see on that. I have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to rush through things real quick here. Not a lot of action going on in the silver market. I want to take a look at crude real quick because crude really took a drop here. You can see that uh, the action in crude seems to be a breakdown. It depends on how you draw the lines, but it seems to be a pretty significant breakdown. What is that portent? Deflation, deflation scare. Clearly, it doesn't seem to be war, but we don't know with these markets anymore. Let's look at the Chinese currency real quick, because this is another one that I've been keeping a close eye on. And as I pointed out, I predicted many times that this is going to correct back down and go into new lows. I really think that we're rounding off here and that we're probably going to get a dramatic drop once we get through this low that we tested. I don't see any fundamental reason why the dollar should rally against the Chinese currency. It just doesn't make any sense. The U.S. is getting weaker by the day. China is getting stronger by the day. Now let's go over and look at some of these coins here. A couple of people have asked about some of these coins. Let's start off with the uh, let's see here. Let's start off with the hype about this Kennedy half dollar. Now, I hadn't heard about this until it was posted in the chat on the member site. We'll read a little bit of this. Publicity continues to build for the U.S. Mint's latest collector coin, the 50th anniversary Kennedy half dollar gold proof. But the hype is so great that some dealers are recommending collectors stay away from the secondary market, at least until the market cools down. Three quarter ounce gold coin was initially released on August 5th during the start of the American Numismatic Association's World Fair of Money in Chicago. However, demand was so great for the coin that two days later the mint suspended the coin sales, not just in Chicago, but also at three retail outlets in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Denver. The commander, com, coin commander of the 1964 Kenny Half Dollar, which was issued to remember President John F. Kennedy's legacy, the mint said. The Mint and the ANA made decision to ensure the safety of those wanting to purchase the coin and the safety of their own employees. Huh? I don't know what that means. The Mint said in a press release, and it goes in there, there was like a near riot here or something like that. Uh, the coin went from like 1240 and it's three quarters of an ounce, so it's really worth about $1,000 in gold. Now, I'm into semi-numismatics. I would say that paying... 1240 and that what's that uh 25% premium maybe uh over a thousand dollars so paying 1240 for a thousand dollars worth of gold that's a maybe semi new you're getting past that a little bit but nine thousand dollars that's utterly absurd and so that's just a, a ridiculous panic and uh, doesn't make any sense to me i have no interest in the coin whatsoever um that just seems crazy now Maybe the Mint just didn't predict the amount of demand for that, or maybe the Mint's trying to be like the Perth Mint now and and uh, sell things for higher prices, make a, make, make a nice premium, and not let go of nearly as much gold. Maybe that's what's behind it. So let's look at a couple of other coins here that people had asked about. This is the new Kookaburra. We'll just look at the one ounce. And it's not the greatest picture there, but you can see it seems to me that my initial impression, I would say that it appears that Perth Mint is trying to 
kind of go backwards in the style that they had there. There was a style, I think it was the 2009, that was getting towards maybe a cartoonish look. And then, but the earlier ones were more, much more realistic. So let, let's see if we can pull these up here. Um, you can see here, you see the 2009 here, that's a wholly different type of thing there. Just a whole different style than we're seeing this much more realistic, but it's something similar to what we had back in 2006, let's say. So it seems like they're kind of reverting back to that older style. Is that going to be a success? This is another one that I have that I picked up the 2011. Maybe it's not a less realistic style, but it's just a different type of style. The style is rougher. Certainly the 2012 was also one of this kind of brighter, newer styles, whereas I think this one that we had this year is kind of a reversion back to the older style. Do I like the coin? Uh, I'm okay on the coin. Um, as a semi new me, maybe a buck or two for it might be interesting, but I certainly wouldn't pay very much more of a spot for that coin. Just doesn't really impress me that much. Now the other one that we're looking at here is the one ounce lunar series, the number two series, which is the one I follow. And it's the year of the goat that just came out. And I had the one ounce here, but it, it's kind of a poor picture. So I pulled up another picture here, and this is a little bit better image of it. And so it's also kind of like the older, more realistic style. I'm a little bit more impressed with this coin than I am with the Kookaburra. But at the same time, if you look at the premium on it, this one's about 31 bucks. Now, when the Horse Series came out, I think I bought a roll. I've only purchased one, 20, one roll of the Horse Series. And that was because it was, in my opinion, overpriced initially. Now, it wasn't nearly as overpriced as the Dragon because the Dragon Series was absolutely ridiculous. I think those came out at about $99. And then eventually, when no one bought them, I think they dropped them to 50 and then all the way down into the 30s but still the, so that dragon was ridiculously overpriced the horse was a little bit a, a little bit overpriced as opposed to uh, normal ones and you know a lot overpriced is a, you know looking at the history of it but the, I love this coin so much I wish that I could get this coin for say under 30 bucks, but I've never seen the coin under 30 bucks. So for me, there's absolutely no comparison with the goat coin and the horse coin. Now, I have always been a big fan of these half ounce coins. And you can see here that the half ounce horse is still pretty cheap. And one of the reasons I've I'm such a fan of them is because I bought a lot of the half ounces in the past and I've seen that the ones that were the popular series they quickly gained value and so for me in the horse series right now if you're going to pick some up then that half ounce is, is a pretty good deal. I, I forgot to check and see if there's actually a half ounce goat series. Yeah there is. So you're able to get an ounce of this for about 27 bucks, whereas if you if you buy two half ounces, whereas if, if you buy the one ounce, you're paying three dollars more. So gonna have to say probably a general thumbs down on the goat, although I like it better than the Kookaburra. I really don't like either one too much, and I'd be keeping an eye on the horse series to see if those prices drop at some point, pick them up. And if not, then just accumulate the half ounce. That's just my personal opinion. 
Now I wanted to jump over to this latest from Marshall Swing. I wanted to cover this because, and I'm putting in a member update because I'm criticizing a, a, another Christian who's giving his interpretation. I don't want to, you know, come out and bash him in public, but I wanted to warn you about this type of thing here. And you can see here, it starts with this sentence. It, this is about what he expects, you know, everything's going to blow up. If you follow King World News, you know that every other day there's some gigantic thing about to happen. But he actually gets involved in some date setting here. You can see he says, I will repeat one more time, the worldwide economic crash is next year. It is well planned, unlike the almost disaster event in 2008. I don't know. Maybe it's well planned. Maybe that was well planned. I don't know. I personally believe it will occur at the same time the biblical Daniel 70th week begins on September 23rd, 2015. Now that's kind of all he says about it until we get down into the comments and he kind of elaborates on it. He He's taken a task by a lot of people and he kind of elaborates on it. He says also a couple have asked the basis for my saying September 23rd, 2015 is the start of Daniel's 70th week. All I am allowed to do at this time is give some clues. That's kind of a strange statement. Then he goes into his math. And of course, I, I don't have time to go into it here, but I don't agree with any of these interpretations about the verses and, and these Jubilee cycles and this all this stuff. And... Uh, I could probably just quote you one verse here that pretty much tells you what I think about this. It says, this is in Mark, and this is 1332. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man. No, and that's very interesting. You see, knoweth no man. I'm a man, you're a man, and Jesus Christ is a man. The Son is a man. Knoweth no man, not the angels, neither the Son, but the Father. So this day and hour is a secret that only the Father knows. That's very interesting because there's nothing else like that. Although Jesus said, "My Father is greater than I," and things like that. But this is so. This seems to be pointing to something really important. Now I don't have time to go into the eschatology and the implications and the difference between the Church and Israel and all these things because. That's not what my channel is about. Hopefully, at some point, I have enough um, I have enough support that I can do that by itself and not have to ask for money. I'm very reluctant to do anything that has to do with the Bible for money because I see it as a very dangerous trap, and I think a lot of people should take heed that that can be a very dangerous trap. Now, I want to show you some of the things that have happened because of people making these sorts of predictions. So if you remember fairly recently, we had Harold Camping in the news. Now I, back in 1994, bought his book where he made a prediction, but he's more famous recently for his recent prediction. And you can see he's now dead, July 19th, 1921 through December 15th, 2013, was American Christian radio broadcaster, author, and evangelist. Beginning in 1958, he served as the president of Family Radio, a California-based radio station, etc., etc. Camping predicted that Jesus Christ would return to earth on May 21st, 2011, whereupon the saved would be taken up to heaven in the rapture, and that there would follow five months of fire, brimstone, and plagues on earth, with millions of people dying each day, culminating on October 21st, 2011, with the final destruction of the world. He had previously predicted that Judgment Day would occur on or about September 6th, 1994, and I've got that book still. His prediction for May 21st, 2011 was widely reported in part because of the large-scale publicity campaign by Family Radio, and it prompted ridicule from atheist organizations. There's a verse about that because of their ways shall the um, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of because of them. 
and rebuttals from Christian organizations after May 21st passed without the predicted incidents. Camping said he believed that a spiritual judgment had occurred on that date. Now we'll see that when we get to the Seventh-day Adventists because they do something similar there. And that the physical rapture would occur on October 21st, 2011, simultaneously with the final destruction of the universe by God. Except for one press appearance on May 23rd, 2011, Camping largely avoided press interviews after May 21st, particularly after he suffered a stroke in June of 2011. October 21st, 2011 passed without the predicted apocalypse, leading to comments that Camping's ministry would collapse after the false prophecy. And it goes on. He ultimately apologized for this, and uh, so that's Harold Camping, a date setter. Now, here's another one. This is actually a very interesting one because this is the Seventh-day Adventist Church and they did something very similar to camping in that when their date that they predicted passed, they actually said something happened on that date, but it was something you can't see. So you can see here in the history, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the largest of several Adventist groups which arose from the Millerite movement of the 1840s in upstate New York, a phase of the Second Great Awakening. William Miller predicted on the basis of Daniel 8, 14 through 16, and the day year principle that Jesus Christ would return to earth between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. In the summer of 1844, Millerites came to believe that Jesus would return on October 22nd of 1844, understood to be the biblical day of atonement for that year. When this did not happen, an event known as the Great Disappointment most of the followers disbanded and returned to their original churches. Some Millerites came to believe that Miller's calculations were correct, but that his interpretation of Daniel 8.14 was flawed as he assumed it was the earth that was to be cleansed or Christ would come to cleanse the world. These Adventists arrived at the conviction that Daniel 8.14 foretold Christ's entrance into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary rather than his second coming. So, kind of like Harold Camping, you had something that you can't see now. So, they were kind of right. Something happened. So that's Seventh-day Adventists. Here's another one, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, they're different from Seventh-day Adventists in that Seventh-day Adventists are legalists. Jehovah's Witnesses are actually Unitarians or non-Trinitarians. They don't believe in the deity of Christ. And But they came out also of a false prediction I don't have that here in front of me. So I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. But basically, a, a prediction of Christ's return was made, and it, it didn't happen. And they revised things, and they revised them again, and predicted again, and did all this stuff. So what's the danger in this stuff? Well, the danger in this stuff is that you're going to follow some man and... It's kind of like some of the PSYOP things that you witness today where if you see them doing something that's ridiculous and it's just unbelievable and anybody in their right mind wouldn't believe it, I could name any number of false flags or any other thing like that. And yet a large number of people believe them. That's kind of, once that happens, they kind of have you. Just like these people who believed in these predictions, the predictions didn't come true, but they still believed there's really not, not much more you can do after that point because there's not really anything that can convince them that they haven't made up their mind based on the facts. So I, I don't have anything against Marshall Swing, but I think it's very unwise to do this sort of day counting thing. Now I, I, and he's quoting the CIA fact book on the length of a generation. And uh, I think if you look into Matthew 24, where it's talking about this generation shall not pass for all these things were fulfilled, it, it seems fairly clear that it's the generation that sees the beginnings of those things start to happen. Pretty much just a statement that it's all going to happen within one generation. You can also do a law of first occurrence and look up the word generation in the Bible through Strong's Concordance, which is the real way that you find the definition of words. You find 
their first occurrence, and then you also find them explained in other places in context. And you'll find that a generation was actually first used when it was referred to Noah, where God said, I found the righteous before me in this generation. So that was the generation that was destroyed, that lived with Noah. So it's very dangerous to begin to follow a man. And you have to think for yourself. I always encourage you to think for yourself, whether it comes whether it's about the Bible, whether it's about markets, whether it's about history, whether it's about a lot of things that I think are false flags or mind control or things like that, you really have to think for yourself because if you follow a man, then when that man goes off course, then you're just going to follow him into the ditch. And that's definitely not a good thing. And we'll talk to you next time.